Hi there, and welcome to the Carpenter's Desk. Today we are joined with Prem Isaac. Prem Isaac is a Christian apologist based in the US, who is also a senior data scientist by profession. He holds a double major in physics and computer science and an MA in philosophy from Southern Evangelical Seminary. He has taught the New Testament and apologetics across churches and colleges in the United States. And in 2007, he was the plenary speaker for the Jesus Week kickoff at Columbia University, and he has addressed the members of the Faculty of Philosophy Department at Northwest University in South Africa and several colleges in India, Norway, and Qatar. Prem also served as the International Director for Ratio Christi, a global movement that equips university students and faculty members to defend the Christian faith. Welcome, Prem Isaac, to the Carpenter's Desk. Thank you. Pleasure to be here with you. So uh, to our viewers, uh, this would be a little bit different from uh, the general uh, conversations that we do. This is much more of an educational type. So it won't be like the general uh, question and answer. Uh, so we would be discussing on the topic, uh, philosophical presuppositions of modern science. So before you know, we dive into the topic, you know, I would just want um, our guests to please uh, you know, tell us about yourself, your ministry, and uh, what are you passionate about? and you know things that we we would love to know uh, sure so i am from south india i'm from tamil nadu i was born and raised in a in a christian home a traditional christian home my uh, parents both have uh, some kind of training in science my my mother is a professor of human anatomy and my father was a veterinary doctor so i grew up in a home where we attended church on sundays and we, uh, we were involved in science education uh, during the week, at least my, my, my mother was, and my father's a practicing veterinary doctor. So I grew up with um, understanding and loving science um, just from watching my parents. So as I grew older, by the time I reached my, my let's say, age 10, age 11, I had learned about the theory of evolution. And having learned, learned evolution, it produced major problems in my faith. Um, I, like most people, was used to the Sunday school version of Christianity that would be appropriate for a 10-year-old. Uh, but I was learning about um, the evolutionary theories when it comes to organic evolution, as well as evolution of the universe. And it posed a huge challenge for me, and I became somewhat uh, of an agnostic when it came to Christianity. I would, have, I would never call myself as ever having been an atheist, but I did uh, come to a place where I didn't know whether the Bible itself could be trusted. And I stayed in that state uh, of uh, struggling with questions that uh, couldn't be answered either by my parents or by my peers or even uh, the, by, by the church community. I stayed in that state uh, for an almost 10 years until my third year of college uh, when I came to know uh, Jesus as my Lord and Savior. After that, I took another two years of just paying attention primarily to my faith before all these questions about harmonizing my faith with science came back to the forefront. And so I slowly got into apologetics, really to answer questions for myself. After that, I started seeing the need for um, training and presenting on the subject because I saw a lot of people in, the, in a situation similar to mine with, uh, with similar experiences. And so that's how I started my ministry, uh, going to college campuses and to churches. And uh, from there, I developed more and more of a burden to see that um, with newer um, technologies emerging and science becoming more popular, more people becoming more aware of uh, scientific theories. So the popularization of science uh, made the conversations about the faith to uh, invariably end up uh, becoming discussions about science. And so this, uh, sort of confirmed to me that I sh that this is a, a real need when it comes to evangelism, but also to uh, for discipling Christians in the church, and uh, that's what led me to 
persist in this in the ministry. And eventually, I had the privilege for uh, for me to attend seminary where I got trained in apologetics. And since then, I've been. Um, it's been really the joy of my life to to provide some of the answers and just be around a learning community of young people who are interested in the faith. You know, you have a very interesting qualification. I mean, you have a BS in physics and then a master's in philosophy. And, you know, in a modern setting, this is kind of very um, intriguing, I must say. You know, someone having a, a degree in physics as well as philosophy. So how do you look at this? Because, you know, in, a, in the modern setting, you know, sometimes philosophy is looked down upon and science is sometimes a champion as or the true path to knowledge in that sense. So uh, uh, to be fair, I had, um, I was quite skeptical about philosophy myself. Uh, when I went to the seminary, I was surprised to find that there was a Christian seminary that offered philosophy. Because I would have thought you would go to a secular college or university to find uh, a major in philosophy. And uh, of course, it is a huge switch. But what I found out is that philosophy is a, a more general discipline that helps to think about uh, issues of reality and knowledge, morality. So in a sense, philosophy is a handmaiden to study theology. So I think my biggest switch was not from physics to philosophy. My biggest switch was actually becoming a person of faith and learning to enter the world of the Bible and learning that theology from um, the Bible is actually relevant for today. That was the biggest switch, because before that, I was pretty much a materialist. I mean, I was not only somebody who studied physics, but I didn't think that human beings had a soul. I had a lot of problems with, um, with believing that, that uh, God existed and could be known in the way that the Bible said that he would be known. So I was more skeptical. Um, so my, that was my first switch in, my, in thinking is that accepting the, the scriptures to be authoritative and uh, starting to study theology. So now when you start studying theology, you find that philosophy is very helpful uh, because theology can itself become very obscure. If you read theology books, you'll find there's a whole range of words and phrases that only theologians know and use and talk about. Most other people have no idea what they're saying. And so um, I came to the seminary to study apologetics. And the way they explained it to me was, Prem, if you learn apologetics, it will be like buying canned food. So someone else has built the argument and you're learning what the argument is. And so when you need to use it, you open the can and you heat the food and use it. Mm -hmm. However, if you want to learn how to cook, which means that tomorrow a new obstacle to Christianity might arise. Um, something that has not been seen before. So what you want is a general understanding of how to handle arguments. Then it's better to go uh, learn philosophy. And then to my surprise, I discovered that this split between what we call modern science and philosophy is rather recent uh, in comparison to the history of both science and philosophy. In fact, by the 17th century, even the 18th century. Um, science, physics used to be called natural philosophy. So this was quite a, a, a discovery for me that they didn't have a word for uh, modern science. They did not use the word science because science was done, all, most learning was done in Latin and the word science just means knowledge. It doesn't mean physics, chemi chemistry and biology. It just meant knowledge in general. So if somebody said they're a natural philosopher, they were really either physicist or biologist or chemist. They refer to the study of wisdom and seeking us after wisdom as, as philosophy. Not only uh, is it a naming issue, but if you go back in, in, in uh, the history of philosophy uh, to the time prior to Christ, about 500 years prior to Christ, you find that the early philosophers were more like scientists. So they were actually studying, asking questions about the universe. They wanted to know how did, how did we end up with the world looking the way it does? Which is really a question for cos today, cosmology. But they considered themselves and they were known as philosophers. So 
to be a philosopher back in the day, which would be, you know, prior to, prior to the time of Christ over 2000 years ago, meant that you were equally interested in things that we would call physics, chemistry, and biology as much as what we normally call philosophy. So the discipline itself was quite uh, merged with, uh, with science. So that's sort of a partial answer. Um, so they're not, they're, they're not as um, far apart. Now, it's, that's not to say that when you get to modern philosophy, you'll find philosophy diverges so much. And you have Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy. So there are branches of philosophy that look so esoteric. And it really depends what you're, what you're looking at. As an example, moral philosophy is fundamentally very, very different from something like physics or chemistry. But um, if, if you're uh, looking at metaphysics or epistemology, which is a theory of knowledge, it sort of serves like a foundation to, to, uh, to science. So I would argue that every scientist is doing some kind of philosophy in their mind. They just don't think about what they're doing. It would be like breathing or uh, some sort of autonomous bodily function that just happens all the time and you don't think about it. So everybody, whether you're crossing the road, whether you're driving a car or whether you're a scientist, you have some sort of philosophy, some sort of viewpoint on the world and what is true and what is real. Uh, and so all philosophy helped me to do is to start examining those, those things and applying reason to them. In the modern setting that we live in, uh, science is given so much priority, like people who study science or maybe a physicist and, you know, they have a hierarchy there, it's a physicist, chemist, and then biologist. So uh, people who are doing natural sciences, uh, they kind of, uh, you know, try to say that, uh, uh, look, this is how it is. And this is the only way to finding the truth. Uh, there is no other method, you know, of gaining knowledge. And uh, can you please explain on that and the method of science and how is, how is science different from scientism? And what is the cultural authority of science? Sure. Um, so definitely um, I have had the, these sorts of conversations at home with my mother because my mother is a biologist and I studied physics. So mm -hmm. I, I've had numerous uh, occasions where I would um, sort of try to punch holes in the uh, in, in her view on, on biology. And I would say, look, mom, you know, biology is after all at a base level, it's nothing but uh, chemistry in action in, in a very confined context. And if you study chemistry hard enough, you're going to eventually realize that what's really going on is properly studied in physics. Mm -hmm. And so this, I'm, I'm quite um, aware of this, uh, this hierarchy. You know, people see physics as much more fundamental because of the subject matter. The subject matter is much more fundamental. Um, so I would say that, uh, it, this is something that has happened, um, in our, in the modern time because of the, um, the, the enlightenment, the industrial revolution, the different social, uh, movements and revolutions that have affected, uh, Western society and then affected the whole world where using the methods of science, we have been able to discover how the world works, how, uh, living things work and consequently we've been able to harness nature and solve problems so this is for this reason science has become very uh, revered and it has gained this this uh, authority if the authority is on if, if science is revered for what it's able to do that would be okay but what has happened is that science the authority of science has now become more cultural wherein if if uh, a scientist pronounces a claim on something that has nothing to do with the subject matter of science, everybody still listens. And so the, the idea is that uh, non-science is, effect is effectively nonsense. <laughs> and so science is the only pathway to truth on any subject matter. So I would argue that uh, the cultural authority of science. Uh, this is some, a quotation I'm, I'm uh, uh, reading from uh, works by other people. The cultural authority of science is the authority that is granted to science in any, any particular context. This authority is as much a matter of image and perceived legitimacy as of statutory guarantee. 
This is uh, coming from a book writ, uh, entitled The Cultural Authority of Science. Um, so what, what this is, is that there is a public image, even if, even if science cannot deliver uh, a true answer, there is still a perception in the public that um, science and its, its methods are superior to any other method of learning. So think about some of the um, famous uh, scientists and, and physicists. Uh, some, some of them have commented about uh, the, the position of science in the sphere of learning in general. So Carl Sagan is uh, no, known to have said, the cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be. If you're coming from a Christian background, that sounds a lot like um, the doxology. Uh, <laughs> holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And so, but here what it is, is it's the metaphysics of modern science where uh, Carl Sagan's view, and it's shared by a lot of uh, scientists and uh, physicists, is essentially materialistic. In other words, it is not God who was always there, will, is now and will be, but it's just matter. So other than matter, there really isn't anything. So this is not so much about the method of science, but it's a view on the world that all there is, is matter. Um, and then you have Steven Weinberg, who's a particle physicist, who was uh, awarded a Nobel Prize, and so he said, he said uh, in fact, this was, uh, he made this, the following statement when he was receiving the Nobel Prize and he gave his acceptance speech. He said, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. Now, at least he was being honest, coming from an atheistic uh, uh, worldview, he was unable to find objective meaning, but he thinks that the methods of science have told him that. So this is more on the method that as we understand the universe through the methods of science, the idea that there's some meaning, and meaning is definitely an artifact of your philosophy, of your worldview. Meaning per se is not studied by physics. It's philosophers who study what meaning is. So you can see Steven Weinberg is bridging this gap and he's saying, I have discovered there's no meaning because my scientific methods have told me that. Uh, and then you have E.O. Wilson, who, say, who said, we can be proud as a species because having discovered that we are alone, we owe the gods very little. So the way he understood it is that the methods of science have rendered belief in God to be absolutely unnecessary. So obviously they're creating um, some kind of a split between uh, religion and other elements, uh, other disciplines of learning it's not just religion, but anything in the humanities, like literature, law, music, art, on the one hand, and science on the other hand. So I think when you start putting scientists, science on a pedestal and worshiping it, then that is, you're really distorting science. And so the word we have for that is called scientism, where science is considered so high in the learning, in the hierarchy of subjects, and what each subject is able to to uh, study that we think that even subjects which are, have nothing to do with science, that when a scientist speaks on any subject, then it's time to listen. And every other discipline should stop and listen to the science. So that would be called scientism. What is science? Well, science is really an attempt to render the natural world understandable by building some kind of model that usually involves cause and effect relationships. So if you're studying organisms, you look for similarities, you look in, in function, in form, and then you ask, why are they similar? What is the cause? And if you can determine a small set of principles by which you can uh, give a causal, cause and effect explanation, then uh, you've been able to build a scientific model and that models uh, acceptance will be based on how well it explains actual phenomena. Things that we can see, hear, smell, and touch are better explained using that model than not. And so that model will become part of the scientific body of knowledge until another model that is able to give uh, more 
uh, explanation, possibly a simpler one, but cover a, a wider variety of a more, more, more subject matter, may come and re replace that. So science, is, in that sense, um, scientists can improve on the models they build. So this is not to say that the subject matter of science can be extended. So physicists typically study physical phenomena. Biologists study uh, living things. So there is a proper subject matter for each. Now there is some debate as to how do you demark the subject matter that science should be studying versus subject matter that's, that should be studied by other disciplines. But it's very clear that science does not study, uh, for example, justice. Uh, science cannot actually study beauty. So I would argue that uh, science is really about phenomena. And it's about building these cause and effect uh, uh, explanations that can be tested against empirical phenomena. We have something called as weak scientism and strong scientism. What, what is the difference between these two? Um, I'll start with strong scientism. So strong scientism is a rather dogmatic view on the part of those who hold it, that science is fundamentally superior in its method and in its scope for being able to determine what is true. So a proposition is true if and only if it is a scientific proposition. So the scientific method that was set forth by uh, Francis Bacon, uh, uh, for example, it should be applied and things should be uh, studied using the scientific method and whatever uh, hypotheses are formed and then tested and verified by scientists yield the only knowledge that you could possibly have. So everything is reducible to doing science. So if you're thinking about why someone is depressed, for example, uh, fundamentally we see that person as being part of the subject matter of science. So there's nothing about that person that falls outside science. So you don't talk so much about their, their moods and their um, spiritual life or their uh, upbringing. You see them more like a collection of atoms that are organized in a certain way. That then need to be studied only using the methods of science. So whereas uh, psychologists in the past would try to work with universals like love, joy, peace, courage, um, things like this when they're counseling someone, because these are sort of universal principles that people believed applied to the soul. In fact, the word psyche in the, in the Greek really means the soul. Uh, psychologists today will sort of see you as a set of well-functioning, well brain functions that are reducible to some sort of chemical process or perhaps some sort of uh, chemical imbalance in the person that's making them feel depressed. So in other words, um, there's something called reductionism. Mm -hmm. So everything, every object, living or otherwise, is nothing but a collection of atoms. There's nothing beyond that. So things like uh, peace and joy and love and friendship, uh, th these sorts of things really don't have any existence. They're just sort of names for other things, which is really chemical processes. And so the, the only way to solve problems is to ask scientists uh, to solve them for you. So there are no truths apart from scientific truths, or even if there, there are uh, truth claims, there are no reasons for believing them. So the scientists should be left in charge to, to run the whole world on every level. So that would be strong scientism, it's pretty dogmatic. Weak scientism seems to be a little bit more open to there being truths outside science. So weak scientism's uh, general statement would be something like this. There may be truths of minimal importance in other disciplines, but science is the most serious and authoritative sector of human learning. So science is still kept on the pedestal, but it is cut, um, but the people holding to the position of weak scientism would say that there are truths in 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 other disciplines. So belief outside science can be rendered rational or acceptable only to the degree that it can be reduced to science or given scientific support. So they're less dogmatic, but they still think that 
science should be like the umpire or the referee. So in any game that's played, you have a referee. And the referee is one level higher than the players. And the referee looks down upon the game and, and can make a pronouncement. And no one gets to challenge the, the referee. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, they allow people to play games. But science is the referee. And science still calls the final shots. Mm -hmm. So that would be sort of weak science, uh, uh, scientism. So the idea is we have an intellectual and perhaps even a moral obligation to use science to solve problems in other disciplines. So if there's in, in law or in justice or in aesthetics, if they end up not being able to solve a problem, what you should really do is call a scientist. <laughs> okay, so, uh, but the reverse is not true. That would be the claim. So if, if scientists are not able to solve a problem, there isn't anybody to call. Yeah, so where, where is the problem between uh, with these two uh, positions? Like, what is the problem with strong scientism and what is the problem with uh, weak scientism? Well, generally, it's the, it's the problem is the same problem, which is that scientism ignores the, the status of science as a, as a discipline. So not all disciplines are equal. There is a hierarchy, but this has to do with how many principles they assume. And that's the difference. So as an example, um, biologists assume certain things for them to do biology. And so there's a set of assumptions that biologists bring with them. There's a set of principles that they think apply to their subject matter. And those assumptions cannot be justified by biology. But that's not true only of biology. It's true of, of, of any discipline. So I'll, I'll give you a simple, simple illustration. No discipline proves the existence of its own subject matter. So biologists do not prove and cannot prove that things are alive or that there are living things. They assume that there are living things and then they study them. Um, when you study living things, you find that there are other the living things are made up of smaller things, which are really the subject matter of a different discipline called chemistry. And so these uh, chemicals, uh, molecules uh, and atoms and so on, they interact with each other based on certain principles that chemists have discovered. So this is sort of it shows you that there is a hierarchy. So we have physics as being more fundamental. So the, here's the question, what is below physics? So is there anything below physics? So what is common to all the sciences? That is, and when I say common, what I mean is what assumptions are common to all the scientists? The position of, us, uh, of scientism would say there are no assumptions at all, that science itself is at the ground level and there's nothing below it. So answering this requires us to dig deeper and uh, go on belief, beneath the, the, the outward manifestation of science and then ask, what does science actually use? Does science use things that are developed from other disciplines? And lo and behold, the answer is yes. There are many things that science depends upon, which means that science cannot be used to prove those things. And so once you start seeing that, then you start seeing that thinking of science as being authoritative in its, in its own subject matter is okay, but thinking that science somehow stands above all the other disciplines is not okay. In fact, it's okay only in the sense that there may be other disciplines that are holding science up on their shoulders. So that's where I would go with it. It's a show that science needs other um, ideas which it did not develop mm -hmm. and therefore it cannot science cannot be the discipline that will justify those ideas True. any more than any more than you could be sitting on a tree branch talking to a friend um on the second floor of a house next to the tree if you were to use a, a saw and you sawed off the branch you're 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 um you're sitting on 
you couldn't have that conversation anymore because you undercut the very thing that's holding you up. So science is sitting on the tree branch. The question is, what is the tree branch? Hmm. Something else is holding science up. And what is that something? So that would be um, the way. Once you discover that uh, for science to function, there are other ideas in play. Uh, then we can ask, what are those ideas? And then you develop a more moderate picture of science. As, as you were saying, you know, science is based on other ideas. So what are these ideas? What are these presuppositions that we talk about and on which actually science is based? Can you please, you know, explain? Uh... Sure. So um, some of the presuppositions as we go through, they are so much part of our set of assumptions that it's, it's almost um, shocking to, to even name them or even think about justifying them. It, it's in the same way that you would, that arguably a fish doesn't actually think about breathing water because it is immersed in it. It is not something that fish spends any time thinking about. The fish is either running away from being uh, the meal of another fish or it is looking for its own meal. Um, and the fish is really interested in other things, not in, in thinking about things which appear to be so close. Um, it would be like wearing contact lenses. You sort of forget that you have them on. And that is the whole point of having contact lenses, is that they function, you see through the lenses, but you don't think about the lenses. So here are some of the uh, presuppositions that science cannot operate without. Number one, the existence of a mind-independent external world. In other words, the belief that there is actually a world outside your mind. Uh, number two, that that external world is actually orderly, as opposed to being sort of magical and disorderly and, uh, not, and not, not rational. Number three, the belief that scientists actually believe that they can know the external world, that it's actually possible to know the external world, that it's not beyond reason. So you have to actually believe this. Uh, number four, that our senses and our own learning mechanism is reliable. So this question was posed, for example, by uh, René Descartes, who uh, was a, a French philosopher who changed the course of philosophy, actually, when he asked the question, how do I know that I know? How do I know that what I think, think to be true is in, actually in fact true? Uh, the reliability of our senses and cognitive uh, faculties. In other words, the belief that our senses, our, our physical senses, as well as our mind is capable and reliable to be able to function with in order to arrive at truth. So how do I know that my mind is working well? How do I know that I'm not being deceived? How do I know that my senses are not deceiving me? Uh, the fifth one would be the principles of logic. Uh, no discourse can be carried out without using logic. No one can do science or uh, any other discipline without using logical forms of reasoning. Um, then you have the truths of mathematics. So science relies heavily on mathematics. So what about all the truths and the theorems of mathematics, which have nothing to do with phenomena? Then we have um, the, the, the problem of induction. So science is an inductive um, discipline, wherein we look at a small sample of phenomena and try to create a set of principles that we then say apply to all similar phenomena. So a, that's called the problem of induction, and it's a well-known problem in philosophy. Then we have ethical and aesthetic values like symmetry and beauty. These, are, these really belong in a philosophy department. It's under philosophy that you study things like what is beauty, what is good, what is obligatory, um, what is right, what is wrong. These are philosophical ideas which scientists actually use. Uh, in fact, symmetry uh, finds a big role in physics today. Uh, then we also have the adequacy of language. So if, if there's anyone who speaks more than one language, uh, the person is probably very, very much aware that there are certain ideas or certain moods that can be captured in one language, but are very hard to translate into another language. 
and you sort of something is lost in the translation. So uh, if that is the case, that means that not all languages are able to capture uh, what every other language is able to capture. So here's the question. How do we know that the languages we use are able to capture all that we need to capture when we are studying science? Well, and, and not only that, can science actually prove that the language you're using to study science is itself the best language? Mm -hmm. So these are some of the, some of the presuppositions. Um, I would uh, be happy to pick one or two more and then discuss those uh, to, to understand why, we, we, why these are presuppositions and what, in what way does science actually depend upon them. Yeah, definitely go ahead. Pick a you know, uh, couple of those and just explore, you know, walk us through those presuppositions. Sure. sure. So I'm going to uh, pick the principles of logic. So when we think about logic, we, we uh, think about three laws which are used. So the first one is called the law of identity. The second one is called the law of excluded middle. And the third one is called the law of non-contradiction. So these three laws are called laws of logic. Most of us do not sit and think about these three laws. However, we are always using them. So the first one is called the law of identity, which would state that um, something is the same as itself. So the term cannot be, cannot be changed. The meaning of a term cannot be changed in a discourse. So let me give you an example. Uh, I don't know whether you come across the following uh, uh, set of statements that seem to make an argument for, uh, for God being blind. So they say, uh, and it goes something like this. Uh, they say, uh, God is love. And this is found in the Bible. Hmm. And then we also have a popular saying, love is blind. And then the conclusion is that God is blind. blind. Yeah. So obviously, something has happened there. Uh, in terms of the words themselves, it seems to follow that if God is love and love is blind, then it's a transitive relation that God is blind. But clearly, to state that God is blind seems to be problematic, especially for a theistic uh, view uh, or you know, a Christian view, or for that matter, a Jewish view, or even an Islamic view of God. The idea that God would be deficient in, in being able to, not being able to see properly. Well, what has happened in the discourse is that the word blind the meaning has been changed midway through the discourse. So in the second statement, we say love is blind. The meaning of the word blind in that second statement means that love does not look at, love is impartial. It does not look at the particulars of the person, of the object being loved, of the person being loved. Whether that person has, is pure or, or impure or disabled or not, or whether they are black or white or male or female, that love is unconditional for, for love to be real it is unconditional therefore it is not a function of the deficiencies of the person you are loving that is the meaning of the word blind in the second sentence however when we use the word in the third sentence god is blind we're trying to we have changed the meaning of the word blind there we're saying blind means deficient but in the first, we mean, but in, in the first case, when we say love is blind, we mean that love is impartial. There's two different meanings for the same word. And so the law of identity says, you can't do that. You cannot change the meaning of a word halfway through your argument. So that would be law of identity. Um, where is it used? It's used everywhere. Everywhere. Everyone is using it all the time. If, if, um, if my, bank, if my banker tells me that I have X amount of dollars or rupees or whatever in my bank account, it had better be the case that I understand when they say rupee, what they mean is what I also mean. We can't have two different definitions for the same term and think that our discourse will be going well. It won't. So, um, so that is called law of identity. Then you have the law of excluded middle, which is that any claim, any truth claim can only have two values. Either that, that claim is 
true or it is false. There's no third, there's no intermediate. A thing cannot be partly true and partly false. It's either all true or it's all false. So it's a binary. And then the law of non-contradiction says that if you make two statements that are opposite of each other, both can be false or one can be, one can be false and one can be true, but both cannot be true. So it is impossible to have two statements that contradict each other that are both true. So this is so fundamental that we don't think about it. It's something that we use when we're driving a car or um, riding on a motorbike. Uh, you, you know that you're in situations where before you cross the road, if you see another vehicle coming, either you have to go, go across the road before that vehicle reaches you, or you have to let the vehicle pass before you go. Both of you can go together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that would be a, such a situation where it's very evident that there is a, a, the, the only way to solve it is that one condition has to hold and the other condition cannot hold. So these are laws of logic. They're in place even before you become a scientist. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you're going to prove the laws of logic is absurd. Uh, it is like the foundation that's holding up the building. And scientists are somewhere on the third or fourth floor. Logic is in the foundation. So that's an example of a presupposition. Now, there are people who study uh, logic and its applications. We call those people philosophers. <laughs> you find something that is uh, a very common abuse within the physics community, and that is the manner in which um, mathematics is being used. So uh, Stephen Hawking especially is known to have appealed to uh, some rather esoteric mathematics to try to justify uh, some of his claims. So he uh, is known to have tried to uh, set forth a theory that would require the universe to not have a beginning at beginning. all. Yeah, a, be a beginningless universe, which is of interest to, uh, to apologetics because there is an argument within the apologetics world that uh, relies on there being a beginning to the universe in order to uh, argue for God, God's existence. If Stephen Hawking is right, then that argument would fail because Hawking would have shown that the universe is able to come into being without having an actual beginning. But what Hawking does is that he uses mathematics in place of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And mathematics is sort of, he smuggles a certain kind of philosophy in that is dressed up in mathematical language. So mathematics is uh, used to drive the agenda rather than using phenomena to drive the agenda. So typically physics, the way physics has been done, not just physics, but chemistry and biology, is that you start with some kind of phenomena. There's something that presents itself to the senses for which we do not have a causal explanation or we have an inadequate causal explanation. And starting with the phenomena, we then create some sort of hypothesis. We may use the language of mathematics as needed, but we are forming a hypothesis about something that presents itself to us. Mm -hmm. However, when you're doing things like cosmology, and you're talking about the beginning of the universe, there's nothing for us to actually examine. There's no phenomena that presents itself as such. Mm -hmm. um, so what, people do is they just look, they search science, sorry, they search mathematics to find something suitable that would support the hypothesis. So anyone, for example, studying, uh, who studied quadratic equations in high school will know that uh, you come across these uh, word problems. Hmm. For example, <laughs> uh, the length of a, of a football field is um, you know, twice its width plus uh, an additional 25 meters. And the area is given. And so you can form a quadratic equation and then solve for the dimensions of the, of the football field. Only problem is the quadratic equation yields a positive value and a negative value. Uh, but common sense will tell us that the value that's negative cannot apply to reality, to physical reality, especially to length, because there's no such thing as negative length. So we promptly throw away the negative answer as not pertaining to reality, pick the positive answer and then provide that for, for the, uh, as the final answer. 
Well, that's because we are able to tell the difference between mathematics and physical reality. So imagine you didn't do that. And you claim that, well, there must be another universe in which lengths happen to be negative. Mm -hmm. So that would be an illicit move. That would be an illegitimate move to take something that comes out of mathematics and assume that everything coming out of mathematics um, must have a counterpart in the physical world. And so we see Stephen Hawking doing that. It's not just Stephen Hawking. Others have done, uh, done the same thing. So what I would say is this. Think about the existence of numbers. The very fact that there are numbers. How can you prove that numbers exist? Well, have you ever thought about it? Um, neither the existence of numbers nor the various uh, theorems in mathematics that apply to numbers, whether it's um, uh, integers, whether it's real numbers and so on and so forth, uh, can be proven by virtue of science. Neither physics, chemistry, nor biology can, can prove Pythagoras theorem. Pythagoras theorem is independent of phenomena. It's independent of the subject matter studied by scientists. And yet scientists rely upon mathematics. So this, is, this means that uh, the discerning thinker would have to have some sort of a, a realization of, of, of um, surprise when you do see that mathematics actually functions very well, but to, to describe the world of science. But that is not a given. So an example would be um, Eugene Wigner, who was a hung Hungarian physicist. He published an essay in 1960 entitled The Unreasonable Effective of Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences, in which he described his puzzlement over how mathematics that was invented by mathematicians for their own purposes found its way into physical theories. So the mathematics was not built for science. It was built in the way that mathematicians build their theories with no reference to the outside world. And, but somehow it turns out that some of these mathematical theorems are able to find application within physics. And so this physicist, physicist expresses the surprise. Uh, and so we can see that he has the humility to do that, to show that uh, it is a wonderful thing that mathematics can apply to, to science. Certain aspects of mathematics apply to certain problems in science. But it's not a given that it should always be the case. Yeah. And uh, not only Eugene Wigner, but uh, even Albert Einstein put forward the question. He said, how can it be that mathematics being a product of human thought, which is independent of experience, meaning independence of, independent of physical phenomena, is so admirably appropriate to the objects of reality? In other words, he means the things that physics studies. So Einstein also expressed this, um, this puzzlement and the sense of wonder because he understood that there is no need or reason for mathematics, everything in mathematics to correspond to physical reality. And I think that uh, modern, modern cosmologists go astray when they make that assumption. Uh, they, they think, well, I know what I want to believe, so I'm going to find some mathematics that helps me to justify uh, my position and appear mathematically coherent. And if I can appear mathematically coherent, that is my, my um, substitute for truth. So uh, as we were discussing about the presupposition of science and we looked into you know, areas which science borrows from you know, to expand its own ideas, mathematics, logic, and ideas of truth and beauty and all these things which are outside the realm of science so um, given that you know what do you think uh, you know what's what could be a proper place for science to stand and how would how would people come to appreciate uh, and acknowledge the fact that there are other aspects of uh, to know truth and there are other aspects to uh, uh, you know acquire knowledge yeah it's a great question and a very uh, good way to uh, uh, tie a bow around this and, and bring it to a conclusion. So first thing I would say is that science does not tell us anything. Scientists tell us things. And scientists are fundamentally persons, human persons. So before we assign uh, or try to assign a proper place, a more moderate place for science in society, we should acknowledge that science is done by human beings. And the, the pathway to a more um, 
moderate view of science that preserves the unique insights of science and celebrates science actually begins with scientists being able to, not just scientists, but anybody who's interested in science, uh, being willing and able to acknowledge that they are borrowing from other disciplines. I mean, we're already doing it. All we're doing here in this talk is highlighting and shining the light on the act of borrowing. We borrow from ethics, we borrow moral values, we borrow uh, fair uh, standards of reporting and, and, and experimentation. We borrow from mathematics, we borrow from, um, from aesthetic values, from uh, moral values. We believe things that cannot be proven and that's okay. So acknowledging that we are borrowing from other disciplines opens the door for us to then say, hey, that means other disciplines do have a place. It's a good thing that we have philosophy and ethics and aesthetics and, um, um, and, and so on, and all of these other disciplines that, that permit us windows into reality. And um, so then you get to celebrate science as a human endeavor because that is what we are. Fundamentally, we are human. Some of us are scientists. Some of us are not. And we find truth in one area, and we get to take that truth and apply it in another area. Thank you for your time, uh, Prem Isaac. And it was really wonderful to discuss about science and the limitations of science, the presuppositions of science, and the problem uh, you know, that modern science has. And thank you for enlightening us with you know, a lot of, you know, some things that we discussed were actually uh, you know, a little bit technical, but I hope that our viewers would find it really uh, enjoyable in that sense. Uh, thank you, Prem Isaac, for your time. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. Thanks for having me on the show.